All right. Well, welcome uh, to everybody, whoever's listening to this um, online. Um, so today, I just decided to record here on Zoom. <clears throat> I had my first like senior moment today and recorded this whole lecture on PowerPoint and it uh, didn't record and I couldn't figure it out. So I'm here on Zoom um, recording. We're going to talk about neuroaxial anesthesia. That's what I was tasked with. As you can see, my name is Mitch Gist. I haven't met all y'all, but um, I've met some of you. I'm one of the anesthesia faculty, and um, I did a fellowship in regional and acute pain coming from Wake Forest most recently. Um, up there, you see my weekend look. Uh, you know, it was an active active week. Someone stole my look, um, but here's uh, my more professional look. So uh, if you see me around the hospital, you know, feel free to stop me and say hello, and ask any questions. Um, but we're going to be talking about neuroaxial anesthesia. So on today's uh, menu, uh, we got a few topics, you know, appetizer, main course, dessert, however you want to think about it, maybe the main course first. But um, our three topics would be just going through the neuroaxial techniques, the various techniques that we have to offer patients, and some of the pros and cons of each technique, um, some of the complications associated with the neuroaxial anesthesia, and then just a, a really brief, quick hit on um, ASRA guidelines um, pertinent to anticoagulant and neuraxial techniques. All right, so let's go through these. So, you know, the first thing to know is that, you know, there's multiple different neuraxial techniques. Each one has their applications and each one has their benefits and risks in each in uh, particular applications. And so that's what we want to go through today and try and figure out and tease out why certain neuraxial techniques are used in certain situations. It's like Mike, the situation uh, from Jersey Shore says here, you know, it's all about choices. It's all about options. Like you can have the slice of pizza or you can button your pants. You know, it's hard to get both, but uh, each one has their pro and their con. Okay. So, you know, a more um, educational way to say that would be um, if you look at up to date, and I saved this uh, chart in my phone. I think this is a great chart um, just to take with you. So you has the four basic neuroaxial techniques, a single shot spinal, um, an epidural, a combined spinal epidural, and a continuous spinal catheter. Um, the pros and cons of each technique. And um, that's essentially what we're gonna go through here over the next you know, 15, 20 minutes. It's just talking about, talking through this chart and talking about why we would choose one technique versus another. Um, so this might be one to save. Um, I can send it to you guys, or I can, I'll be happy to send you my presentation too, but um, that might be one to save. Um, so the first technique we want to talk about is a single shot spinal anesthetic. And um, where I want to start here is over here on this model, so, or uh, figure. So just marking, you know, giving us some landmarks. So the lumbar spine, Starting at L5 above the sacrum, there's five lumbar vertebra. L1 would be the top and then the thoracic vertebra above. Some things to point out is that the spinal cord terminates at the L1, L2 level. That's the textbook. So that'd be where the conus medullaris is. And then the um, um, cauda equina down here in, in, uh, below the conus medullaris um, with meninges surrounding that cauda equina. Um, that's important to us that um, it gives us a safe space with which to do um, subarachnoid blocks or spinal anesthetics, right? We, we don't wanna be um, needle to spinal cord up here in the high lumbar, low thoracic cervical space. That's quite a bit more risky for, for um, spinal cord nervous damage, uh, just needle to, needle to cord contact. And you know the, the spinal cord materials, the neurons are much more densely packed in that area. So, uh, we come down here into the lumbar spine where there's just um, exiting nerve fibers and CSS. Um, the other thing to note from this uh, image is uh, the orientation of the spinous processes. So you can see in the lumbar spine, the spinous processes are much more flat than in the thoracic spine. They're much more angulated. So te technically, that makes the midline approach in the lumbar spine um, technically easier than a midline approach in the thoracic spine. Oftentimes the angulation to reach the epidural space or the interthecal space in a thoracic spine is much more angulated than it is in the lumbar spine. 
Um, the other thing I wanted to point out here is that the spinal space, also called the subarachnoid space, just to remind ourselves of the meninges. You'll hear all these different words interchanged. And um, for a spinal anesthetic, you know, another way you'll hear different words for that. So a single shot spinal, a subarachnoid block, um, an intrathecal block, those are all um, essentially the same thing. Um, uh, but um, but the spinal space, the space that has CSF is below the arachnoid matter, right? Subarachnoid. So the dura matter is out here, um, right um, next to the epidural space. Then you have the dura matter. Then you have the arachnoid matter, and then the pia matter. Remember, is on the covering the spinal, the um, uh, cerebral tissue itself, or the spinal cord tissue itself. So so the subarachnoid space is this fluid-filled space. Um, that we're looking to access when we do a spinal single shot spinal anesthetic. And then the epidural space is outside of those meninges entirely. Um, so let's just watch this video. I'll stop it at a few points and point out a few things about the procedure. I'm sure some of you have done single shot spinals and um, are comfortable doing them. But this is for a single shot spinal for a C section. So a very common application of this um, technique. Um, other things we do single shot spinals for would be orthopedic procedures um, very commonly or lower extremity surgical procedures in general. Um, um, anticoagulation plays a part in that, um, whereas it, not as much in cesarean section, but, but that's another situation where we might choose a single shot spinal. Patients who are poor general anesthetic candidates. Um, so you'll see sterile technique, prepping the skin, sterile drape. And then the things I want to point out, um, for those of you who may be drawing up medicines, all those things are normal. For, for some of you who maybe haven't done spinals before, so anesthetize the skin. And, um, you know, we're looking for the interspinous space. So if he's palpated on the back. He can feel um, spinous process above, spinous process below. And um, he's palpating for that interspinous space. And then the first thing that he puts in the back there, let me get to it, hold on. Hard to see it. Right there, that yellow thing, so that's an introducer. The introducer needle is a short needle that's larger bore. So our spinal needles are all very small needles. They're all 25, 22, 23 gauge needles. And um, by virtue of that, they don't have a lot of structural integrity. So it's hard to drive those needles through these dense fibrous connective tissues. So this introducer needle uh, is short. Usually it's parked right in the interspinous ligament just about, and, and um, it provides some structural integrity to the needle, provides it some stability. Um, one, so we don't bend our spinal needles, but also so we don't risk shearing the spinal needles inside the patient. So first the introducer goes in, then the spinal needle goes through the introducer. You'll feel a little give um, once we pop through that dura and um, you'll get free flow and CSF. Get our spinal dose uh, of medicine, whatever local anesthetic or, or um, solution we're using. Sometimes that's local anesthetic and opioid. Sometimes that's local anesthetic, opioid and epinephrine. Sometimes that's just ep morphine. Um, so there's a lot of options um, for what we can put in these doses. Um, but uh, we'll aspirate on that needle, make sure that we have free flow and CSF deliver our dose, aspirate at the end, um, which confirms that we're still in the intrathecal space and, um, and then remove the needle. So the, the advantages of a spinal anesthetic, number one is, is its simplicity. You know, from start to finish, a spinal should take 30 seconds, a minute. Now, obviously there are more challenging spinals. There are more challenging patients, um, but it's, you know, a relatively quick procedure. Um, and uh, just one shot and done. Uh, the speed of induction of, of whatever block, so a spinal anesthetic, that local anesthetic spreads very quickly. And, and within a period of minutes, seconds to minutes, the patient's experiencing dense block in the lower extremities, um, possibly extending up into the abdomen or chest. And um, as compared to epidural anesthesia, where it can take upwards of 15, 20 minutes to figure out if you're headed the right direction, if your epidural is going to work as a surgical anesthetic or not. Uh, and particularly for an obstetric population, that can be a long time. 
if you're looking to get back to a C-section, that 10 to 15 minutes can be a long time and sometimes uh, too long to wait. The other advantage, I think a big advantage of a spinal anesthetic is that it's reliable. So it's not frequent where you get free flowing CSF, you have freely aspirated CSF at the beginning, freely aspirated CSF at the end, and your spinal fails, meaning it doesn't get the patient you know, numb enough for surgical anesthesia. Um, it's not infrequent that an epidural does that. And so for patients who you definitely don't want to do a general anesthetic for um, a spinal anesthetic is oftentimes better, uh, more reliable than, a, than an epidural, a, a dosed epidural um, for surgical anesthesia. Now the disadvantages are obviously that due to its fast uh, induction and its spread, it does have a high incidence of hypotension, sympathetic blockade, you can get some nausea and vomiting associated with that hypotension. Um, there is the possibility of postural puncture headache due to the intentional dural puncture for spinal anesthetic, albeit, those risks are mitigated, and we'll talk about how to mitigate the risks of a dural puncture headache um, later in this talk. I think the big disadvantage that sometimes shies people away from spinal is that you deliver your dose and that's it. And um, the medicine's in, it will last as long as it's gonna last. So you have to choose your dose appropriate to the procedure and appropriate to the surgeons and the situation. And, um, and different local anesthetics have different durations of action. But once the medicine's in, that's it, you know, the time, the, the clock has started. Um, which does <clears throat> bring up the idea of a continuous spinal anesthetic. Essentially a continuous spinal is just a same thing as a spinal, except we're using a large bore TUI uh, to access that subarachnoid space. And then we put a catheter in, um, just like an epidural, but uh, a catheter in that subarachnoid space. So it has all the same advantages of a spinal with regards to its simplicity, its speed, maybe a little less speedy, very reliable. Um, but the big benefit in, in comparison to a spinal is that it's titratable. So both with onset and duration. There are certain patients who are very concerned about their hemodynamics. You wanna keep their preload high, keep their SVR high. And um, we can do that maybe a little easier with a small doses of local anesthetic um, on, for the onset. So we have more gentle hemodynamic changes. And then at the end, at the tail end, we can continue to give local anesthetic. So we have completely titratable duration. The downside is that you're using a 16 or 17 gauge 2E to get that done. And um, the incidence of postural puncture headache with a needle that size is, is large. So it's, uh, you know, we'll talk about it later, but it's about 70%. So, you know, that is a, a big disadvantage of this technique. Um, another big disadvantage that's often not thought about is that you, we expose ourselves to possible medication errors and serious patient safety issues. So say you, you put a spinal catheter in, for some reason we forget to label it as such. Someone comes in and thinks that that's an epidural catheter. They look the same. They're the same catheter. They're in the same location. Nothing else is different about those catheters. They dose that catheter as if it's an epidural catheter. And um, you know, you may remember that the absorption from the intrathecal space or what, you, what medicine you need in the intrathecal space is you know, a factor of magnitude probably lower than what you need in the epidural space. And so there have been um, serious adverse events of providers you know, dosing a spinal catheter um, thinking that it was an epidural catheter. So there are some, some patient safety concerns. You gotta make sure we label those and hand those off appropriately. So our next neuroaxial technique is just a straight epidural anesthetic. Now, obviously we do these epidurals uh, in the thoracic space uh, with our pain team for uh, post-operative analgesia to the abdomen, to the chest wall. Uh, we can do them in the lumbar space for post-operative analgesia, but also commonly for labor, labor analgesia. And I think this is a, um, this is a lumbar epidural um, video, just to introduce the technique for those of you who may not have seen it. I'm gonna mute this guy. But essentially, um, yeah, this is actually good, you know, surface anatomy, right? So we have our iliac crest. That's our surface anatomy marker for, a, some would say the L4 spinous process, some would say the L4, L5 space, you know, it, it's, very, it's variable based on the patient. 
but that's a good marker for a uh, for a lumbar epidural or a starting point. And um, so he marked his his uh, surface anatomy, prepped the back. I'll try and speed through this a little bit. All right, anesthetizing the skin. Um, and you can see the layers you're going to traverse in a, in a lumbar epidural or really in any midline epidural. So, you know, these techniques uh, rely on the provider's um, tactile sensation at different densities of tissues and then a loss of resistance in tissue, which we'll see here in a second. But, you know, for a lumbar epidural or a thoracic epidural, the, the layers we're going to traverse are supraspinous ligament, interspinous ligament, ligaments and flavum, then you're in the epidural space. So there's multiple different changes on the, the sensation, the tactile sensation of the needle um, as you traverse those tissues. And then ultimately what we do to confirm that is that we um, use a loss of resistance technique. Okay, so here loss of resistance to air, you can see that syringe freely injects, whereas before there was some bounce or some resistance in the syringe. That would indicate that the, that the density of your tissue has changed. So the epidural space is a potential space. Once we reach that space, air, fluid should freely inject into that space, just like a blood vessel or something else. So that's what loss of resistance, um, and that's a good loss of resistance example. Um, loss of resistance to air is a technique. Loss of resistance to saline is a separate technique, both accomplishing the same thing. Oh, they're just confirming that you are in that potential space. Now, I will tell you experientially, there's loss of resistance throughout the procedure. So in between different fascial layers, periosteal loss of resistance, um, and it takes a little bit of experience to kind of differentiate the differences in the, in the losses as you move through the tissues. So the advantages of an epidural um, anesthetic are the titratability. Again, a catheter-based technique, you can titrate the onset of your block, you can titrate the duration of your block. If you're in a four hour C-section, you can continue to give anesthetic. If you've done an epidural for a lower extremity fracture, you can continue to give anesthetic. So there's all kinds of options that you have, both on onset and duration. Um, another advantage is that you can convert for labor, say you can convert a previously analgesic catheter into a surgical block, um, simply by dosing additional local anesthetic. And then, you know, if you had used it for a, a surgical block, you can also continue it vice versa. So we can take analgesic catheters and give more medicine for surgical block. We can take surgical, um, our intent was a surgical anesthetic. And then after the case, um, use dilute local anesthetic for post-operative analgesia. Either one of those are options. Now the disadvantages again, big needle, higher risk for posterior puncture headache um, due to that large bore needle. Um, another disadvantage would be that's a slower onset of block. So you don't know for sure if your epidural is going to get you numb enough for surgical anesthetic for quite some time. You know, there are uh, situations where you're waiting 15, 20, 25 minutes and then the patient's starting to get numb. And, you know, at some point you got to, you have to make a decision about what you're going to do. Are you going to try a different neuraxial technique? Are you going to convert to general anesthesia? Um, you know, that, that's the, the playing game of, the art, I guess, of each of this technique is that you're given medication, you think that the catheter is going to work, but you, it takes time to get there. And, um, and by virtue of that, you have to give higher doses of local anesthetic than you would in a traditional single shot spinal block. And I think one of the big disadvantages, and experientially I know this to be true, is that it's a less reliable anesthetic. So when you take a, a say a labor epidural, and you take that labor epidural that's been working great, the patient is comfortable, some proportion of those will just not get the patient numb enough for surgery. And I don't know why, you know, there's, there's anatomic reasons why that could be the case, which we'll talk about, but there's a portion of those epidurals that um, just produce patchy block, and um, you don't get that as much with a single shot spinal or subarachnoid block. Um, the last technique we'll talk about here is combined spinal epidural um, it just combines the two above. So we'll watch this video here for, for people who may have not done a CSE, but epidural needle, you'll get lost in the epidural space. Now, before you thread your epidural catheter, what we're going to do is we're going to take a spinal needle right through the lumen of that big epidural needle, 
puncture the dura, get CSF through this spinal needle, okay, to uh, say we're in the subarachnoid space, and then we're going to give a spinal dose. Now, depending on your application, excuse me, that spinal dose could be a surgical anesthetic spinal dose. If you're using it for labor, that spinal dose could be just a very small dose um, to speed the onset of your labor analgesia, but uh, you're going to deliver an intrathecal dose. And then after that dose is delivered, we remove the spinal needle from the um, TUI. We thread our epidural catheter for continued analgesia or continued surgical anesthesia and, um, and go from there just like a standard epidural. So the benefits of a CSE, uh, which you can see, they kind of combine the two benefits of an epidural and a spinal. So we get the speed of onset of a spinal, the titratability of an epidural. That's the big benefit and that's why it's used is that we can give the reliability of a spinal, but then on the back end, if the spinal starts wearing off, we can give more doses of anesthetic. Um, we can use lower doses by virtue of giving that spinal dose. And, um, and then, you know, the last piece there, there is some data to say that um, a CSD technique for labor epidurals in particular, um, predisposes uh, to more success for la successful labor analgesia. So the, the epidurals themselves are more successful. You know, there are two thoughts there. You know, if you're puncturing the dura with a spinal needle, if, you're get C if you get CSS, that confirms that you're midline and that uh, you're probably midline or close to midline in um, the space. And so your epidural is probably closer to midline as well. You probably get less one-sided block than you would um, with a traditional epidural. The other thought there is, you know, by puncturing the dura, there could be some epidural local anesthetic in a labor analgesic epidural that would seep into the um, intrathecal space and provide maybe a little bit better analgesia. The disadvantages, again, um, high risk of um, postural puncture headache if we have an unintended dural puncture. Um, one of the disadvantages in an OBE setting is that it's difficult uh, to finish the procedure before the patient starts experiencing symptoms. So you bring the patient back, we do a CSE, we dose the spinal for surgical anesthesia, but then you still have a lot of work to do. You gotta take the spinal needle out, you have to thread the epidural catheter, you have to hope the epidural catheter has no trouble threading, you gotta take the TUI needle out, you have to sterilely dress the epidural catheter. So there's still a fair amount of work to be done, all the while the spinal is already working, right? So the spinal and all the things the spinal does is already working. Legs are starting to get heavy, um, blood pressure might start to change, patient might start to get a little nauseated and, and uh, maybe even vomit. So, you know, that's one of the disadvantages of the technique is that it does take some speed. Once you deliver that spinal anesthetic, the clock starts. And then, um, and also because we're delivering a spinal anesthetic, oftentimes we don't test dose these catheters. We'll go into the test dose here in a second, what, what it's used for, but, but there can be some delayed confirmation of where your catheter actually is. Are you intravascular? Obviously we aspirate on these. Um, catheters, but is it an intravascular or an intrathecal catheter? There's some delayed confirmation of that. So just some questions about epidural anal anesthesia, because I think it's uh, it's interesting to talk about. One question is why? Why are epidurals maybe less reliable or less consistent than spinals? And um, I thought this quote was great. Excuse me, those are two um, OB anesthesiologists and they did this whole article about why epidurals don't work. I think it was an editorial. But, um, but the, the takeaway quote from it is, for those who have studied the epidural space, it may seem amazing that epidurals ever work, right? The idea being is that we're putting these catheters into this space, but it's not the only component of that space. That there's fibrous tissue, there's blood vessels, there's connective tissue, um, you know, so there's a lot of things in there that either impede local anesthetic flow, there could be connective tissue bands that it, um, impede flow bilaterally. Um, so it's really a miracle that that, uh, that the epidural ever works, you know, given how packed that space is. You know, the overall success rate for labor epidurals, uh, quoted in this article, so 98 to 99% of labor epidurals provide some level of analgesia. Uh, significantly less of those same catheters provide reliable surgical anesthesia. So that would indicate to us that there's something going on in the epidural space where patients can get comfortable enough, but some of the catheters or some of the patients just can't get uh, surgically dense anesthesia from an epidural catheter. Uh, 
Um, and there are some reasons for failure there, which we won't get into today. Well, I want to mention catheter migration. So, you know, we place these catheters, we leave them in for a while. Labor, they can have them in for days. You know, these thoracic epidural catheters can stay in for five, six, seven days. It's just something to know that these catheters don't stay in the same place that they are originally inserted. You know, they uh, move around, they retract. There have been catheters that have ended up migrating into the intrathecal space or into the intravascular space. Or, so, you know, the, these catheters do move around. There's some level of migration in the, in the patient. So now uh, to talk about the test dose. This is one of the things that um, I was asked to talk about here today, an epidural test dose. So just, just a reminder, right? So when we do our epidural, one of the things we do once we thread that catheter through the TUI needle, we remove the TUI needle. The first thing we do is we put a syringe on and we aspirate on that catheter. And we do that to check for two things. We're checking for clear fluid, indicating maybe our catheter could be intrathecal and we're getting CSF back, or we're checking for blood, indicating that our catheter could be in a, in a blood vessel intravascular. But this is just a reminder that you know, just because you have negative aspiration does not necessarily mean that your catheter is not in that space. So from this uh, review about epidural test doses, it quoted a couple of stats that upwards of 1%, you know, 0.95%, 1% of intravascular placed catheters were undetected by aspiration. You could just collapse the blood vessel down. Um, so there are, you know, one out of 100 that you want to detect and less for intrathecal catheters, but still not in zero. And um, the concern is that although these are very low incidence events, they are high harm events. So an undetected, uh, the harm of an undetected intrathecal catheter um, is potentially devastating or lethal. Um, so we don't just rely on aspiration alone to tell us if we are extravascular or outside of the intrathecal space we give what's called an epidural test dose. And the test doses are designed to accomplish these two goals. So we want to accomplish a, a test for intravascular placement and a test for intrathecal or spinal placement. So just to focus on the intravascular test doses, some of the things that can, you know, have been used and described, epinephrine, um, probably most commonly, local anesthetic itself, um, you can use opioids to test for intravascular placement. And there's some argument, um, which we'll talk about briefly, just to run the epidural. And um, that itself will tell you what you need to know. So um, the first one we'll talk about is epinephrine, probably most widely used. It's what we use here as an intravascular test dose, right? Usually very low dose epinephrine in the range of 10 to 15 micrograms um, in your total test dose. Um, that we're delivering through that catheter. What we're looking for on the backside is things that epinephrine would do. So we're looking for hypertension and tachycardia. So an increase in the heart rate from, you know, greater than 10 beats per minute um, within a minute and uh, systolic blood pressure increase greater than 15 millimeters of mercury within a minute after um, dosage as well. Uh, just something to note that we, um, you know, on the pain service, for instance, when we do our thoracic epidurals, for post-operative analgesia, we monitor with pulse oximetry with blood pressure, non-invasive blood pressure monitoring. And um, typically when we're doing our procedure, that blood pressure cuff's going up maybe every five minutes, you know. Um, to see the changes in a test dose, we got to change the blood pressure interval though, so that we're actually monitoring for the reaction that we want to see. It's possible that we could completely miss the um, effect of epinephrine in an intravascular space if we're monitoring at five minute duration. So that's just something to remember. Um, you gotta think about what you're monitoring for when we're putting on those monitors and the selecting um, intervals. Some of the limiting factors of an epinephrine test dose, labor itself is a limiting factor, and we'll talk about that here in a second. Um, beta blockers, you gotta remember that if patients are beta blocked, you may not see the effects of a true intravascular injection. Um, due to the beta blockade. So this is a um, just a tracing that I pulled um, from Google Images, and really it doesn't matter what the tracing is saying. The whole point of what I'm trying to make, and forget the fetal heart piece, 
the maternal heart rate is not constant during labor. It uh, goes up and down periodically. It goes up and down, you can see, with uterine contraction and varying levels of stimulation and pain. So when we deliver an epinephrine-containing testos during labor, there is a fairly high risk that um, we would have a false positive, right? Essentially that we would deliver a testos and we would see a heart rate rise, maybe around a contraction, and we would consider that a positive test dose. What that predisposes the patient to is a potential unnecessary second procedure and all the risks involved with that second procedure. And that false positive rate is pretty high. For that reason, I think the, um, the thought is for the obstetric and laboring population, maybe epinephrine isn't really even the most beneficial test dose. And there's always some concern about giving epinephrine in the setting of, you know, reducing placental blood flow. So, you know, I, I don't think it's used very widely in the, in the um, obstetric um, space. So our next test dose for intravascular injection would be local anesthetic. So we could give local and essentially ask the patient uh, if they are experiencing any effects of local anesthetic toxicity. So perioral numbness, um, tinnitus, lightheadedness, dizziness, you know, all those things that would make you think that the patient is experiencing, you know, intravascular toxicity symptoms. Um, that's what we would be asking the patient. So we give the dose, we say, if you, if you feel any of these things within the next minute, you let me know. Most commonly, probably lidocaine is used. Um, I think the reason that lidocaine is used is many fold. It's in the kit. So um, it comes in the kit in that little testose vial. That's one reason. Its safety profile is probably a little better than um, bupivacaine, um, giving bupivacaine, you know, directly into the intravascular space. And, um, and then it's also fast onset. So, you know, it works relatively quickly. The big question though is, you know, often we give three cc's of this one and a half percent lidocaine. So that's 45 milligrams of lidocaine. And I was, you know, is that enough medication to help us elicit, um, you know, um, intravascular symptoms? Probably not. We probably need much more. You know, just for reference, at the induction of general anesthesia, we often give one milligram per kilogram. So in a 70 to 80 kilo person, that's 70 to 80 milligrams of lidocaine. So that's a factor of two higher than we would give for an intravascular test dose. And we don't see a ton of local anesthetic toxicity symptoms in those patients. So, um, you know, maybe I'm not sure if that dose is that efficacious. The other concern is that if you had an intrathecal catheter, that dose might be far too high. Um, so this is just an example of some of the local anesthetics that have been used in their doses. You can see um, not many of them have great sensitivities or positive predictive values. This is in the non-pregnant population. You can see that lidocaine, one milligram per kilogram, like what we give at induction of anesthesia, has the best profile, right? So that's, we're gonna catch the most amount of intravascular catheters with a little bit more lidocaine. This is in the pregnant population, um, given anywhere from 100 milligrams of lidocaine to chlorprocaine, BUP, there's a, all kinds of different regimens. And, and again, I don't think any of them are excellent. You know, this bupivacaine, test dose, which on the surface has pretty good sensitivity and positive predictive value, also contains epinephrine. So, you know, it's kind of a double test dose there. Um, so our next intravascular test dose possibility that you could use. So you could use opioids. And um, there are some patient or providers out there that do this. This is so it's pretty new to me as I was researching these test doses. Um, I don't think I've heard of anybody doing this, but it is described to um, give a test dose of fentanyl. So we put in our epidural catheter, we give 100 mics of fentanyl through the epidural catheter. And we ask within the next five minutes if the patient experiences any of the effects um, of fentanyl. So sedation, drowsiness, dizziness, nausea, any of those things that would make me think that um, that fentanyl is intravascular rather than sitting in an epidural depot. Um, and you know, the data from this uh, review article was pretty strong in the pregnant population. That for pregnant patients, the sensitivity and positive predictive value of an opioid only test dose was relatively high. 
And so I, you know, I never thought about that. I never heard of it. Uh, something to consider though. Um, obviously you can't use these test doses later in labor, uh, closer to delivery, but, um, but it's something to consider that it could be useful. And then the last argument that I don't think is a very good one, but I thought I would bring up is that you could just simply run the epidural. Give no test dose and that the presence of inadequate analgesia would indicate extra epidural placement. So if the patient doesn't get comfortable, then the epidural must not be in the epidural space. The problem is the converse is not true. So the patients, um, you know, these are low concentration, low dose, um, anesthetic infusion. So the risk of local anesthetic toxicity is pretty low. You probably, if you just ran the epidural straight into a blood vessel, you probably would not see the effects of local anesthetic toxicity. Um, but what you could probably see, what we know from patients who get lidocaine infusions for pain, and, is that you could see analgesia. So the presence of analgesia does not indicate that the catheter is in the right place. I think that's the downside of this technique is that just because someone is comfortable does not mean that the epidural is in the epidural space. Um, so that's just a, I just wanted to mention it because this idea is out there. All right, so now let's transition to intrathecal catheters. And really there's one test dose, many different medications, but one class. And we give local anesthetic to test for intrathecal placement. Um, all different local anesthetics have been used many different doses. Lidocaine, upivacaine, ropivacaine. I think lidocaine has some advantages in that if you are intrathecal, you get a dense block quickly. Bupivacaine takes a little bit longer to get a dense block and um, would last uh, longer as well if you had an intrathecal placement. Um, I put in there some of the doses that have been used for intrathecal test doses um, just to give you maybe a rough estimate because I know it's hard if you haven't done a lot of spinals, but like for a surgical, for a single shot spinal, surgical anesthetic, we probably get two or three hours out of bupivacaine, somewhere in the range of 12 to 15 milligrams. In a spinal kit, the, the local that comes as your spinal dose in the spinal kit, it's a vial, a 2cc vial uh, that contains 15 milligrams of bupivacaine. So, you know, 15 milligrams, 12 to 15 milligrams is a pretty good spinal dose. You can see people are given much more than that through the um, for an intrathecal test dose. It doesn't really make a lot of sense. For ropivacaine, I would say 10 to 15 milligrams is a, is a pretty good spinal dose. Now, 15, 10 might be on the low end, but, um, but I think that's a reasonably normal spinal dose. And we're looking for, you know, signs and symptoms of, uh, of, uh, intrathecal dosage. So dense lower extremity anesthesia, motor block, um, lower extremity warmness, indicating some sympathetic block to the lower extremities. Um, the trouble, and I don't think this is a, a uh, reason not to use these, it's just something to be aware of. So the trouble with these test doses is that there is some level of risk associated. If you have a truly intrathecal catheter, and you give a large local anesthetic test dose, uh, you could give, you could cause uh, not only dense lower extremity block, but progressive and severe hypotension, bradycardia from sympathetic nerve block, um, dyspnea as that block continues to travel up the, the thoracic spine, starts to control the muscles of respiration, and it can be progressive all the way to respiratory compromise, um, need for mechanical ventilation. So, you know, I've seen this happen. Um, in obstetrics, uh, people given large, large doses of, um, uh, of, well, I guess in this case it was a, there were catheters that they didn't know were intrathecal, but giving large doses of medicine through a, an epidural, they thought it was an epidural catheter and being a spinal catheter, and um, patients ended up having to be intubated. I've seen this in a single shot spinal, um, a little bit different. Uh, we're not talking about test doses in that situation, but people do get dyspneic from, from spinal doses of um, anesthetic. That is not uncommon. So we have to think about um, on, on that, and we have to think about our high-risk patients and if they could possibly tolerate a large um, intrathecal dose. I think this is the takeaway from the article. When we talk about intrathecal test doses, really we should just think about what would I give for a normal spinal? You know, if I am going to give 
12 milligrams or 15 milligrams of bupivacaine for a spinal, then why would I give 20 milligrams for an intrathecal test dose? I'd probably give some fractional amount of what I would give for a normal spinal. And, um, you know, that's all the takeaway is, is that you want to give a dose that would induce spinal anesthesia, but not put the patient at additional risk. Um, just to give you an idea of some reasonable regimens, so here at University of Kentucky, um, I don't know what we do for obstetrics. I haven't seen what they do for their test doses upstairs. Um, for the pain service, you know, for our, for our analgesic thoracic epidurals, we give a 3cc test dose of 1.5% lidocaine with 1 to 200,000 epinephrine, which is 5 micrograms per milli. So we're given essentially 45 milligrams of lidocaine, 15 micrograms of epinephrine, both together at the same time. And the epinephrine is probably our more reliable intravascular test dose in that situation. The lidocaine is our intrathecal test dose. So we want to ask the patient within the first minute or so, um, well, we want to watch the, the vitals, see within the first minute or so if there's a heart rate or blood pressure increase. And then, uh, you know, with tape up the epidural, we'll lay the patient down and ask them if they have any leg weakness or signs of an intrathecal dose. Um, another regimen, just so you know that there are other regimens out there, um, you know, where I came from, our thoracics um, for, our, for our pain service, our regional service, pretty much the same test dose as we do here. Um, for our obstetric epidurals, though, we did two separate test doses with local anesthetic. So we would do, for our intrathecal test dose, we would you know, do our epidural, thread our catheter, and, um, and then we would give two cc's of 2% lidocaine, 40 milligrams. That's an intrathecal test dose, okay? So we would do that and um, start taping the epidural up, lay the patient down, ask if they can move their legs at five minutes. And if um, you know, they have full motor activity at five minutes, then we would consider that a negative intrathecal test dose. And um, then we would subsequently give a bigger dose. So five cc's of 2% lidocaine, that's 100 milligrams. And we would ask the patient for intravascular type symptoms. So same medicine, local, local anesthetic, um, delivered in two separate doses at two separate times to, to assess those two test doses. There's a lot of questions that we didn't really have time to answer here. Uh, you know, should we test dose all of our catheters prior to C-section? Uh, that's kind of controversial. Um, if we should always test dose the catheter. Should I test dose every catheter when I pick it up on service at night or should I trust that it's in the right spot? You know, what is, we talked about this earlier, but what is the rate and risk of catheter migration? And does that influence our need to test dose catheters? And then, um, you know, different equipment types may um, help in this process or may hurt. So, you know, do, does the equipment we use make a difference? Single versus multi-orifice catheters. Multi-orifice catheters might allow us to aspirate a little bit better. Wire reinforced catheters can end up in spaces that you have no idea how they got there. And so they, do they contribute to the risk of intravascular intrathecal placement? These are all questions that may be answered another time or grab me in the hall and we'll get a cup of coffee. All right, let's talk quickly about complications. So we'll start with a case. So this is a 76 year old guy, has AFib, hypertension, diabetes, has lung cancer, and he has a car accident. Comes in, has rib fractures, femur fracture, they consult us for an epidural for pain for his rib fractures. We do the epidural, great. He's got good analgesia. But a couple of days later, becomes hemodynamically unstable. He has a liver laceration. He has to go back to the OR for, and uh, gets an X-lap. And during the X-lap has, you know, coagulopathy and bleeding, gets a massive transfusion, has subsequent coagulopathy from that. Um, goes up intubated, but is extubated later that night, um, you know, after he gets extubated, he starts saying that his legs are weak, but everybody thinks, you know, he just had general anesthesia. He's probably just a little weak um, overall. A few hours later, he can't move his legs at all. And, um, and then after that, his nurse starts noticing that his bed's wet. Um, and um, now he's having severe back pain. So this is a classic, you know, um, progression for an epidural hematoma. And for him, probably he had some coagulopathy related to his procedure and massive transfusion. But, but we're going to talk about epidural hematoma as, a, as an interaxial complication here. Incidence is low. Okay, that's the takeaway that we should tell our patients. The incidence of this is low. However, it's a high harm event. Okay, so the incidence is low, but we should always be on the lookout for these types of things. And the other thing to realize is that the incidence is very low in obstetrics, 
but it is um you know 18 fold higher in non obstetrics so still low but quite a bit higher in the patients who are non obstetric um, risk factors for an epidural hematoma include older folks uh, people with coagulopathy people with history of gi bleeds um, and females and the things we're looking for are signs of uh, spinal cord compression, right? So we're looking for progressive loss of sensation or weakness, frank weakness in the lower extremities bilaterally. So even in bilateral, that's important. Loss of bowel or bladder function, um, so some autonomic involvement. And then different from epidural abscess, epidural abscess is kind of a slow onset back pain, epidural hematoma, acute onset back pain. What do I do if this happens? So I'm holding the pain pager, I get a call, and somebody's weak, and um, there's concern that they might have a hematoma. So really what you're gonna do is you're gonna do a lot of things at once, okay? It looks like it's like a checklist, but we're gonna do a lot of things at once. The first thing that we do, we stop the epidural. There's always a chance that the patient could have gotten either too much epidural medicine or the epidural itself is intrathecal, and that alone will resolve some of the symptoms, okay? So we're gonna stop the epidural wait for an hour or two hours, you know, but we don't just stop, start, you know, stop there. So we're going to stop the epidural, but at the same time, we're calling our pain attending. We're involving the neuroradiologist to possibly get an, a stat MRI. We're going to call neurosurgery and put it on their radar and say, hey, this patient has an epidural in place, high risk for hematoma, and uh, we stopped the epidural, but I just want you to know he may need to go to the OR, right? And the idea is like same thing as myocardial infarction or stroke, is that time is the is your big enemy okay so um, we have to do these things quickly so we we get all of our people in place that if we had to proceed to to surgical intervention or emergent imaging that all of that is available for us and at the same time we're going to stop our epidural and assess the the um, progression of our symptoms and yeah if, if, if we're not making any headway at an hour or two hours max we got to get that patient to the MRI or we got to get that patient to the OR, okay? Because the spinal cord um, can't withstand that level of uh, compression for that long. This is a little flow sheet, um, uh, you know, about neuraxial anesthetic complications. Up here is basically what we said. So did they have a neuraxial anesthetic? Is it possible that it could be some sort of compressive neuropathy? No, it's bilateral, it has loss of, it has autonomic um, involvement, loss of bowel or bladder fu function. Um, and so we need emergent imaging and we need to consult neuro, okay? Um, neurosurgery to get their involvement. All right, on to another uh, complication. This one is infection. So this is something that, um, when I was at Wake Forest, I was a regional fellow there, and there was this just like, you know, nutty patient that we put a peripheral nerve catheter in and sent the patient home, and sure enough, they came back and had just a frank infection at their catheter site, their peripheral nerve catheter site, just, you know, pus, and we had took the catheter out, and and um, I turned to the resident who was on call with me, and he and I said, you know, that's rule number one, you don't put a catheter in crazy, and uh, then he said, he said, actually, you don't put anything in crazy. And then somebody like across the room said, don't let crazy put anything in you. And that pretty much sums it up. You know, you know, we'll talk about some of the data behind uh, catheter related infections. But the idea is that, you know, we got to think about our patients, what we're sending them home to, what they're able to take care of, what kind of uh, assistance they have when we put these catheters in. And even here in the hospital, we need to, you know, watch these catheters very closely because infection is a real phenomenon. Um, this is a, a, an article from anesthesiology 2018, so pretty recent, huge retrospective analysis about infection. They, you know, the incidence of infection is still pretty low. So for peripheral nerve catheter, upwards, you know, anywhere from zero to seven percent, epidural catheters quite a bit lower. Um, probably peripheral nerve catheters higher based on catheter location. So obviously if you have a subgluteal sciatic catheter, it could be dirtier than say a interscaling catheter, you know, for instance. And um, the rates of infection vary widely based on uh, placement technique, placement location, and how long the catheter has been in place. This is the take home chart right here. So you'll see, we won't talk about peripheral catheters today, we're talking about neuraxial anesthetics. So for epidurals, at day four, 99% of those epidurals are infection free, so that's good. 
But at day seven, you, you start to see a, a trend in the wrong direction. So at seven days, we start to see that, you know, 5% of those catheters are now infected. At day 15, 27% of those catheters are now infected. And so that's why, you know, when I uh, round on the pain service, I say, you know, about day seven, Day six, seven, you probably got to get that catheter out, regardless of whether it's working well or not, regardless of whether the site looks well or not. And, you know, the risk benefit has to be far in the patient's benefit to leave that catheter in place because the risk of infection rises pretty steadily past day seven. Um, the other piece of this, this data set that I just want to point out, and this, these are the, the curves. Um, so you can see when we reach this red line is 90%. So um, the probability of infection-free catheter use reaches less than 90% at that seven-day mark. But this is an interesting flow sheet from the paper as well, is that um, so of their 45,000 patients, um, 1,500 roughly had infected catheters. Of those infected catheters, 36 were left in place because they had mild to moderate infection, okay? So uh, of those 36 left in place, 31 were mi mild and five were moderate. And, um, but the interesting piece is that every single catheter that was left in place, the 31 mild infections progressed to moderate infection. And the five moderate infections progressed to severe infection requiring surgical exploration. So it's just something to know. If you, if you are ever concerned about a catheter, if there's some skin breakdown or, um, you know, the patient's experiencing, you know, you know, signs or symptoms of epidural or catheter infection, it's just time to get it out. Those, those infections will progress. All right, next complication, posterior puncture headache. Uh, we'll, we'll kind of breeze through this. This guy right here, August Beer, credited with, um, you know, inventing, pioneering the spinal anesthetic, having a great mustache too. So this is his, uh, from his journal, talking about, you know, they did spinals on each other, him and his assistants. And so this was one thing he said, two hours after the operation, his back and left leg became painful and the patient vomited and complained of a severe headache. The pain and vomiting soon ceased, but the headache was still present the next day. So that's following the first spinal anesthetic that he did. And then somebody did a spinal anesthetic on August Beer, uh, a cocaine spinal. And uh, he said, I had a feeling a very strong pressure on my skull, became rather dizzy when I stood up, so it was positional. All these symptoms vanished at once when I lay down flat, but returned when I stood up. I was forced to take to bed and remain there for nine days. So it was self-limiting, it resolved. And, um, and yeah, so his symptoms resolved nine days after the lumbar puncture. So these were the first descriptions of posterior puncture headache. And you know, we don't really know exactly why posterior puncture headaches happen. Um, Physiologically, there could be two potential mechanisms that I think are, you know, largely agreed upon. So we all know that there's CSF loss, but how does CSF loss cause a headache? And there's two theories. So one theory would be we lose CSF, and when we sit up, that CSF loss is exaggerated. We have downward stretch and pressure on the cerebral meninges. We activate those pain fibers, we get a headache. The other um, theory would be you know, the CSF, the brain, and the cranial vault have this, um, there's a constant volume that has to be there, okay? And so if we lose CSF, we gain intravascular volume, we gain intracerebral volume. And so there's some vasodilation, increased intracerebral flow, which could contribute to headache. Both of those uh, mechanisms are plausible. I don't think either one's been proven, proven more likely than the other. There are diagnostic criteria. So these are the things when you get called about patients with potential posterior puncture headaches, these are the questions that we ask. Number one, is the position, is the um, headache positional? So does it worsen within 15 minutes of sitting or standing and improve within you know, 15 minutes of lying down? Um, so that would be number one diagnostic criteria. And, and then oftentimes these headaches have associated symptoms. So neck stiffness, tinnitus, photophobia, all those things associated with the headaches might indicate a posterior puncture headache. Um, we have to always ask, did a dural puncture occur? It is theoretically possible to have a um, sp spontaneous dural leak, but it is not likely. So we have to ask ourselves, did the dural puncture occur? And, um, and then usually these things resolve on their own. That's, that's another take home point here. Not all um, headaches 
are postural puncture headaches. So even if the patient has had a dural puncture, not all headaches are postural puncture headaches. That's something to remember. Um, that there are many different differential diagnoses for headaches. Well, now I may have to take out my uh, AirPods here. I think they're dying. Um, yeah, okay, I think we've changed over now. So yeah, not all headaches are postural puncture headaches, um, even if patients had a postural or dural puncture. So we have to rule out the rest of these things. Some of these are much more concerning than a postural puncture headache. Meningitis, pituitary apoplexy, you know, um, some are less concerning, migraines, sinus headaches, but we need to go through that differential diagnosis. Some risk factors, so there are patient risk factors, there are procedural risk factors. Some of the patient risk factors, these headaches are most common in patients, you know, in their 20s and 30s, very uncommon at the ex extremes of age. So young people, old people don't really get as many postural puncture headaches. Females greater than males, and that's outside of obstetrics as well. Um, people with pre-existing headache problems. And then folks that, you know, have, have um, comorbidities that make epidural more difficult, probably just make, that make unintended dural puncture more likely. So things like obesity and um, prior back surgery or hardware, scoliosis, all those things, excuse me, make unintended dural puncture more likely. Some procedural characteristics, these are things that we can modify. The type of needle, cutting versus non-cutting needles, the size, the gauge of the needle, the direction of the needle in relation to the fibers of the dura, and, um, and then the experience of the provider. There's some data that say more experienced providers have less postural puncture headache. So here's the, the needles and their incidence of postural puncture headache. And I'm just gonna skip ahead real quick. Um, so these are common spinal needles, okay? And the first three, you can tell that they're kind of pencil point shaped. The last two are called cutting needles. So these are pencil point needles. These last two are cutting needles. These last two are quinky. These uh, first three, this one is a Whitaker. And um, I think these first two are both Whitakers or one of them's a Sprott. This is a Sprott needle. I don't know what this B needle is, but this first one is a Whitaker. C is a Sprott. Those are both pencil point needles. So you can see the, the pencil point needles have a lower risk of, um, of unintended, of dural puncture headache than the um, cutting needles. Um, I'm gonna go get my, my charger real quick, just one second. Sorry about this, guys. This is the world we live in now. Okay, um, anyways, smaller needles, less risk of postural puncture headache. Some things I wanna point out, a TUI needle, a big 16 gauge TUI needle, 70% incidence of postural puncture headache if we have a dural puncture, but it's not 100, okay? So not everybody who has a, a dural puncture with a TUI gets a postural puncture headache. Um, that's just something to remember. The things that we can do to prevent postural puncture headaches, we can use smaller needles, we can use non-cutting needles or pencil point needles. And then we can just select the patients that are high risk and low risk who really need those procedures. We won't talk about any of those. The thing I wanna mention here is that the vast majority of postural puncture headaches resolve spontaneously with conservative therapy. So 50% of these resolve within the first four days on their own, about 70% resolve within the first seven days on their own. That's without epidural blood patch. So, um, when we see these patients, I always tell them this. I say, look, the vast majority of these resolve. Epidural blood patch is not a procedure without risk, risk of infection from blood products being injected into the epidural space, risk of repeat dural puncture. Um, so it's not a no risk procedure. And the conservative therapy, the mainstay is caffeine, um, hydration, NSAIDs. Those are probably the, the three mainstays. The last three may be a little less effective. Um, and just so you guys know, this dose of caffeine, it's about like two or three big blonde roast coffee. So you just got to tell someone to, to drink a lot of caffeine. Um, yeah. So that's post puncture headache, just in a nutshell. Um, 
the last piece here that I'm going to talk about is um, is the ASRA guidelines related to anticoagulants. You know, long story short, there's all these guidelines running around from different institutions. Uh, a lot of them are out of date, and um, the things you know that you need to know are probably not on the sheet. Where I'd like you to look is not on some of these guidelines, but I'd like each of you to download this ASRA app. It's like three, three bucks or four bucks, but you'll use it the rest of your career and it's constantly updated. Okay. So it has the most recent um, guidelines in relation to anticoagulants and neuraxial procedures or pain procedures in general. And um, it continuously updates when new anticoagulants come out. So um, I did this one. This is a, uh, I just took a screen recording of me using the, the app. Okay, so we open it, we say begin. All right, we want to go in and, and um, then we're going to, you know, pick from here, we pick a um, anticoagulant that we're concerned about. So we have a patient who say is on prophylactic Lovenox daily. Okay, and we want to know for a neuraxial block, um, how long do we have to hold the medication before we can do the procedure? So we say hold medication before procedure and um, we should be going there here in a second. All right, there you go. 12 hours. We have to hold the medication for 12 hours. Um, and it also, I think the, the real benefit too is that it, you can click this little information tab, it takes you to the consensus, consensus statement. So it gives you the data. If you really wanna go look at the data on why we're holding things four hours or 12 hours or five days or seven days or INR plus 1.5, then you can go and see the data, okay? Uh, but I just mentioned that because that's you know very important. So it tells us how long we have to wait to do our procedures. It tells us how long we have to wait to restart anticoagulation after we after we manipulate the neuraxis, after we pull a neuraxial catheter like an epidural, it's very important and, and it's ever changing. These things have changed, you know, in the past, I'm not, I haven't done this for too long. So in the past three or four years, they've changed. So um, I would just encourage each of you to, to download the app and kind of look your way through that. That's all I got. I almost made it on one charge, but I didn't. I'm sorry for uh, taking a break there, but um, Hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, I'm always available for questions. Just shoot me an email or um, come find me and, and we'll chat. But you guys take care. And um, I suppose I will see you later.